Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top selling authors and the up and coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is Renier de Graff, author of Architect, Verb, The New Language of Building, published by Verso. It'll be released on the 28th of this month. Renier is an architect and writer. He's a partner in the Office for Metropolitan Architecture. He leads projects in Europe, maybe Russia now, and the Middle East. Not Renier anymore. is the co-founder of... Uh, the think tank AMO, and he is the visiting professor of urban design at the University of Cambridge. He's also the author of Four Walls and a Roof, um, which, as you <laughs> may actually be more critical than this book, um, he is well, that, Four Walls and a Roof, The Complex Nature of a Simple Profession, and also the novel, The Master Plan. So, architecture has been de defined as the art and technique therefore the word of designing and building as distinguished and opposed from the skills associated with just the construction. Renier and his work modifies the noun per force to a verb. And in so doing gives us a new insight, not only to how and why buildings are built, but the baggage, if you will, that is associated with them from honors and awards to nomenclature, which includes chapters on world-class buildings we admire today maybe some that are failures, their excellence, their sustainability, their wellness, their livability, their beauty, among other attributes, including placemaking, which neither of us know what it is. Um, he does so with biting wit and humor, um, and oftentimes a bit of <laughs> disdain when he calls things monsters, uh, <laughs> buildings. And it must be, I feel, it must be somewhat problematic at times, given the fact that his, the pro his profession is the one that he uh, critiques. So welcome, Renye, and thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Hey, so is my definition of architecture one with which you basically agree? Um, sort of. I think, uh, you know, what sets a piece of architecture apart uh, from a building is not the fact that one is designed and the other is not. I think it is the level of consciousness that went into the design uh, that makes certain buildings architecture uh, in, in a certain way. Just as I think Philip Roth uh, said, the point of literature is not to invent fact, but to invent consciousness. And that sets literature apart from books. I think something similar applies to, uh, to architecture, which is why... Uh, which is why I enjoy writing about architecture, uh, even sometimes in my writing, disagreeing with my very own work and my own profession. Well, the title, uh, and as I, I was saying, as a bookseller, I ask about it all the time, and I ask in every interview, uh, because the people who come into my bookstore judge the book by its cover and title, even though yeah. they're mandate it not to um, <laughs> yeah well so the, I mean, so, the, so the title you turn a noun into a verb it's almost oh, like i a, didn't do that i know i yeah i read i read go ahead and, well, we'll tell the story of the title then um well the book initially was called measures of success but that sounded too much like a management book but it, that the theme uh, initially of the outline i wrote for the publisher was about how my job architecture is increasingly subjected to measurable and supposedly objective criteria, such as livability, such as well-being, such as happiness, um, uh, um, what have you, uh, all of which are increasingly subject to measurement, uh, given a kind of an objective aura, uh, therefore objectively establishing what good and bad architecture is. Whereas I think one of the essences, one of the things that's essential about architecture that you must never be able to tell that so unequivocally. And um, so that was the title for the longest time. I was never really happy with that title, but I didn't have a better one and, and et cetera. And then only at the very end 
the, the last part of the book is a dictionary. And it's a dictionary that came about from me during COVID, sitting through endless Zoom and Teams meetings, listening to financial specialists, engineers, uh, advisors, consultants, et cetera, uh, you know, who jointly are involved in the process of making buildings. And I, I kept notes. And at a certain moment, I heard so many terms that I didn't really know what they were, um, that I started jotting them down uh, and, and ended up with quite a few of them. So then the idea came to make a dictionary, pretty much like Ambrose Pierce's Devil's Dictionary. So the end of the book is, is a dictionary. It's called The Principles of Prof Speak, which is what I called it, which is, of course, a play on George Orwell's Newspeak. Uh, and then one of the words in there, I mean, one of the points of that is that certain words are um, verbs, nouns, adjectives, all at the same time. And during COVID, that was um, a very effective technique never to do any work, because any word could be, when it can be a noun and a verb, um, if it's a verb, you have to do something. If it's a noun, it's a casual observation, often non-committal. So therefore, if any word is interpretable as a noun or a verb, you have the perpetual excuse only to talk, never to do any work, which is what much of these meet <laughs> many of these meetings felt like. So one of the words in the dictionary was architect as a verb, as uttered during one of those meetings. And I thought it was so absurd. Uh, and at a certain moment, it came to me that that should be the title. Uh, it's like in a novel, you have a tiny detail that sort of exemplifies the point of the whole book. This word, for me, exemplified the point of the whole book much catchier than, uh, than Measures of Success. So it's, it's a dictionary entry. It has architect in it, which I guess the book is about architecture. Um, and that was it. It's, an ex it's a sample of the very many absurd and manipulative twists that we give to language, not always for good purposes. Glad you brought up Ambrose Bierce because this is the first dictionary I read where most of the time I was laughing out loud. I think, am I at first I was thinking, am I supposed? How is he feeling about these these words? But that we're going to the end of the book. Uh, I wanted to talk about the epigraph because, again, as a bookseller, that's something I look at. And the epigraph is so funny because it's oh, before I go to the salutation that is the epigraph as a in business and in management and building, which I'm in, and law, you know, everyone now says, reach out, loop in, circle back. Yeah. I have no idea what any of those mean either, like placement. No, neither do I. I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to join you in the ignorance. And then when they sign it, best, comma, I have no yeah. idea what that means. What does that uh, mean? Well, it can mean sort of anything and everything somebody else uh reads into it and at the same time give you the privilege of deniability yeah it's like saying stay safe what does that mean don't go into the bellevue stratford you know <laughs> well whatever yeah right. well anyway so the epigraph to whom it may concern yeah well it's hilarious but what were you thinking when you did that? it's I, it's it's interesting because you were obviously sent a proof uh that one I took out. I'll check in the final print that I have in front of me if indeed they did take it out because I asked them to take it out because I want to reserve that for my next book, which is going to be a work of fiction. Uh, and therefore, uh, no, they took it out okay. at my behest. Um, yeah. I just got the PDF, so. Yeah, uh, but I mean, initially it had that. I like it. Um, because it, it's, it's a book of partly about language, the language of my profession used by very, very many people. It, it partly ridicules those language. It takes that language apart and uh, without necessarily naming culprits or, or users of the language per se, I try to keep it fairly decent and polite. Certainly. Uh, and, and that was that, that epigraph to whom it may concern, you know, whoever recognizes himself as a prolific user of those terms, maybe ought to scratch themselves behind their ears and think again. Well, let's start at the beginning then, which we went to the end. Let's start at the beginning. The first, and you know, you have great uh, chapter titles, but the first one is Stark, Star Architecture, Star Architecture, yeah. which implies this awards, honors, this idea of creating your persona as a portion of the actual architectural 
process. Yeah. Um, I remember one of my commercial buildings won best commercial building in the Southeast, the Aurora. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think then I realized after reading your book that the reason I got it was because I paid the entry fee. Yeah. Well, there is, I mean, that's, the, yeah. And then, and then you're one of the lucky ones. I mean, I think there are those who receive awards unwittingly and then are charged in hindsight. I mean, that's the, um, the, <laughs> the plot of that particular chapter you're alluding to. That happens. Though so they get a letter in the mail that they won an award, please pay up. Oh, and then they ask if you want to buy a plaque. Which yeah. Plus like that. It's an industry. But I mean, so many awards that there's almost more awards than architects. So rather than the architects competing for awards, it's actually awards competing for architects. That is so wonderfully absurd. Yeah. Let's talk about Capital Gate. But before you do call it, talk about um, the various awards for buildings that are the thinnest, that are the... Go ahead. Not me. Why don't you go ahead? I talk too much. You go ahead and tell what those uh, are. Do you, you want me to read a piece? I mean, I yeah, think yeah, yeah. Go ahead yeah, and read yeah. that piece and then right. let me. Capital gate. Okay. Give me 30 Thank seconds you. to find it. Uh, it's a chapter called Officially uh, Amazing. Let me see. Uh, yeah, so in, I'll, I'll try and in, uh, no, no, no. I can cut out this little section. Yeah, yeah. so it, it says the first Guinness Book of Records was published in 1955. In addition to records such as the tallest man alive and the oldest living woman, the list features just two building categories, the world's tallest skyscraper, then the Empire State Building, and the world's largest office building, then the Pentagon. In 2021, the list has come to include the world's largest mirrored building, the world's fastest automated parking facility, the world's most slender tower, the largest television building in the world, record held by Authors Firm, uh, the highest outdoor infinity pool in the building, the largest roof in the shape of a star, the largest building in the shape of a shoe, the largest building in the shape of a bird, the largest building in the shape of a picture frame, as well as the, worst, the world's first artificial fog building. And where does the just to give you an idea? Where does the Capitol Gate get its? Uh, uh, it's it's. Uh, if I'm sorry, this is. I mean, I'm I'm. I'm somehow developing a form of Alzheimer for my own nonsense, but. Uh, I remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's the it's the largest man-made leaning tower. Uh, or building. No, um, and. Uh, it is that because obviously the Tower of Pisa was straight when it was erected and nobody wanted it to be leaning, but those are the forces of uh, gravity uh, and nature that made it lean. Uh, this was a building that was intentionally meant to be leaning from the get-go, hence, um, hence the adverb man-made. And again, because of... Uh... A good book always leads you. When you're done the book, you're always lead, led into something else. And so I read, um, what's what's the TV show, the Nova, the PBS show of uh, mega build, mega buildings, mega structures, mega structures. So I watched the entire mega structure yeah. on um, Capitol Gate, and yeah. it is absolutely amazing. But the question you ask is why? Yeah, why? So what's the answer? There has well, to the answer is because we can you know uh, and that's of course no answer uh but i mean it is the answer underlying quite worryingly an increasing portion of, portion of architecture not to serve any use or purpose per se but to be a demonstration of its own abilities its own capabilities its own virtuosity it's, it's like a form of uh, acrobatics to demonstrate the spectacle that can be generated without any other purpose per se than the spectacle. Um, it's, and that's what the, the essay continues to say, it's particularly a feature that we now see in uh, regimes where the public sector and the private sector are one. Uh, autocratic regimes, often with uh, oil, gas, uh, with large sovereign wealth funds at their disposal, wherein the way the revenues of the spectacle, 
which is in a way more visitors, more people coming there, more people traveling on government owned airlines just to witness the spectacle. They also sit in perfectly commercial buildings like hotels, they visit, they buy real estate in the proximity. So the spin off of an in itself meaningless spectacle building radiates well beyond the building uh, itself and actually flows into the pockets who, who, of those who cough up the money. If you look at, uh, well, buildings, I would say in the United States or in Europe built by private developers, the budget sheet, the balance sheet of that building is always between the building cost and the revenues created by the building itself. And the wider implication of the buildings, of course, they can be there, but they don't necessarily flow into their pocket. Therefore, uh, there is you know, a certain break. They put the break on in terms of extravagance, whereas once that economy is a single economy, you know, once the wider revenues flow into the pockets of those who initiate the building, then of course, there's almost no limit to the spectacle, just as long as the spectacle can be monetized. And it can, so that happens in Abu Dhabi, that happens in, in Dubai, where all these private development companies are ultimately held by the state, by the royal family, uh, et cetera. And what seems to be a diverse market economy of miscellaneous property developers is actually a state controlled single economy. And that's particular, my theory of the book is that it's ultimately the point of capital gate is not that it leans, but that it's in Abu Dhabi that it's in a place like Abu Dhabi and only in a place like Abu Dhabi um, would that happen. I mean, even China today has uh, launched uh, the notion of weird buildings after too many of those buildings and in, in as a plea to sort of uh, return back to normal. Because also, again, China, it's a communist state, but its economy is is very differently organized. So in my view, it's these type of buildings are the product of particular economies, very often petro economies. Yeah, like the Burj, obviously, or Kingdom yeah. Tower. Yeah, and then when your neighbor builds the tallest, uh, it's a big effort to build an even taller one. So then you simply invent your own category in which you can be the best or the first. But at the and same that time, explains why there's so many categories. But at the same time, the first syllable is art. And when you look at the building and when yeah. you watch it being built and then the finished product, there is this awe that's created in the viewer and this idea of how is this possible? Yeah. How do they counter the structural uh, effects of, hey, it wants to fall over. So, yeah. and beauty being in the eye of the beholder, what value do you give? Or when you look at it, do you consider it art? Do you consider what you do art? Uh, that is a... I spend most of my time radically exercising the concept of art from architecture, but that is a kind of a longer story. What I think the difference is, and that is also uh, the point I think of the essay, is that of course, and I, I make the comparison to Falling Water by Frank Lloyd Wright. I make the comparison to Mies. And of hey, course, you, you can- hey, Who would build, you go, why would anyone build a, a house over a waterfall? Waterfall, this, that's the same why, um, applies to uh, falling water as I guess ultimately as it does to Capital Gate. The big difference is that falling water is, or, is an invented response or is an acrobatic response to a self-invented challenge. And once you enter the domain of records and the Guinness Book of Records, for me, it's a surrender to impose challenges. I think it's a very, very fine line uh, between the two. And I think architecture has a certain tradition, has a certain evolution where the themes, you know, gravity is a big theme in modern architecture as well. Defying gravity is as much a factor of Niemeyer as it is of Capital Gate. Nevertheless, there is a difference. And Niemeyer never wanted to set a record with his inverted pyramid. It was an architectural theme. This is a response to a leader who wants to enter the Guinness Book of Records, and then it becomes part of the brief. And I think once you enter that realm, you, you lose a fundamental part of your own autonomy and independence uh, as an architect. And if you regard architecture as a form of consciousness in building, uh, as, as somehow a critical discipline, I think that distinction is paramount. Well, so I criticize I, my, my first book, Four Walls and a Roof, was an elaborate criticism on the pretentiousness um, of architects, of the myth uh, perpetuated by architects, 
this book is in a way of puncturing the myths projected onto architecture by others equally misguided. Well, if you, if not more, if you take Frank Lloyd Wright as an example, he didn't really care about the commission from the, no. owner of the property. Yeah. And so you have fallen. And I think that is so great. Well, I think that is so great. I mean, and probably the guys you see in the documentary, they were well within the pocket uh, uh, of their client. Yeah, it's a big difference. They were totally at the beckoning call of their client. And Frank Lloyd Wright couldn't give a flying fuck about clients. He had clients in order to build. Those people built in order to have clients. And that's the fundamental pivotal point, I think. And that's also the pivotal point that the book very much discussed. Which, you know, leads, yeah. which leads me to like, okay, falling water is unlivable and it leaks. And I've been there, it's, you know, in Pennsylvania, where I am in Philadelphia, where the Bellevue yeah. Strap is. Um, but so, so that boils down to the basic fight between architects and engineers is form over function. Yeah. And, and if you build something that's beautiful, but you forget that there's got to be mechanical equipment somewhere in that building, or if you build something that's functional and then secondarily. Yeah, but what? You know, that's, uh, well, if falling water were built today, it wouldn't leak. It would have mechanical engineering to be perfectly uh, all right. That's also, I mean, uh, it's also a product of the time. Modern architecture was a recent phenomenon there. Mechanical engineering was a recent phenomenal there. They are all, I mean, and practically every Le Fila Savoie has similar ales. Uh, the Farnsworth House by Mies is, of course, unlivable in the summer, too cold in the, et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole series of mistakes to older buildings that apply to older buildings almost of any nature. So I think it's, it's not entirely fair to always uh, measure older buildings on, onto contemporary uh, technical standards. Um, I, I, for me, the key difference is that he was something, he was doing something he believed was right. These people of Capital Gate are doing something to please somebody else. And, and, and therein lies for me a, a majorly philosophical distinction, even if, even if the end results, uh, each in their own way, are functional or dysfunctional, it is that mindset, and it's it's fundamentally there about the position of our discipline. Are we ultimately only providing a service to those who deploy our services, or does a discipline embody uh, a world of knowledge that that has uh, a raison d'être in itself? What about take, coming at it from a different way and continuing to try to paint you into some kind of corner? So you take the poster that I have in my office of Frank Lloyd Wright's Mile High Building. Uh, yeah. which actually could happen. But at the time, it was obviously impossible because the materials were unavailable to create the structural integrity. But it's a beautiful picture, I think. Yeah. So is that art? It wasn't built, but it looks beautiful. You could look well, at I it. Mean, you, know, you know, I never think about whether anything I do or any of my colleagues do ever as art. Uh, I mean, uh, it's it's that's the first chapter in a way uh, about the Guggenheim deals uh, deals very much with that uh, with that question. I think even the domain of art is very dangerous territory to draw comparisons with because art ultimately has a different independence. It's 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 a different thing. I never think. About, I mean, maybe Capital Gate is art. I mean, uh, you know, art is what we decide as art. Um, and then we trade it as art. And then if we have enough people agreeing that it's art, the prices of art go through the roof. But I find it a very difficult uh, thing to project on architecture. I think architecture is something altogether different than art. And if art resides in precision and doing something almost implausibly well, then yes, I guess one could say uh, that certain subliminal buildings are art, but I've always very much shied away from that question. I mean, most of my writing is deliberately unpretentious, deliberately ironic, sometimes fictional, uh, in the hope that I never have to answer questions like this. <laughs> well, <laughs> when I achieved my I mean, goal. Oh, uh, okay, but well, I mean, I... Yeah. 
I'm, I'm Mark, trying to think of the passage. I think I put it somewhere far more eloquently uh, than I say it now. Uh, and, and that's the damn thing about writing. Once you get it off your chest, you get it out of your brain and you become useless as a, as, as, as a merchant of your own books. But I think uh, whether Frank Gehry or any other architects thinks architecture equals art is ultimately of no importance. The point is the difference in expectations. Art enters the economic cycle with a disclaimer that it is art, while architecture can never enter the cycle without its ingrained obligations, the building's function, its effect on the city, public opinion, and so on. The more these obligations can be measured in commercial terms, the more inescapable they become. When it comes to numbers, architecture can be held to account in a way art never can. Ironically, the Bilbao effect, the ultimate allegiance between art and architecture, has only exacerbated that difference. Yeah, but if you talk about, again, coming at it still another way, you have a lot of fun, as does the reader talking about the Carbuncle Award. And if you equate beauty with art, then here it's, you say, they say ugliness because it is the ugliest building. So it's ugly, which is the opposite of what I consider art to be, although ugliness can be art, I suppose. Ugliness can be art just as easily. I think that's, you know, art is about the successive destruction of preconception and myths, including the one of beauty. So... That's true because that's true because you cite Umberto Eco for semiotics, but he also wrote a book on beauty and on ugliness. Um, yeah. So yeah, let's talk about semiotics then, signs and symbols with real because you do bring it up. Mm -hmm. So what are the symbolic? I mean, in terms of semiotics, I can get into a cab and say Penn Station. That's the one symbol I give to the cab driver. I never have to say another word. I have go from one place to another. What's the corollary of that in architecture, if there is one? Well, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm desperately trying to be more helpful, but uh, yeah. I mean. you, but you do talk about Umberto Eco and semiotics. Yeah. Right? So what did you mean? Uh, well, can you be more specific? Well, okay. So can you refer about, to the passage? No, because it's on my PDF and it's on my computer and I can't find it because I don't have the paper. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I mean, I have the same problem. But um... but uh, well, I guess if we're just talking, what I'm saying yeah. is architecture does project symbolic, symbolic. Well, you, you talked about, you talked about it when you talked about um, Capitol Gate. Yeah. The symbolism, the sign is that it's not the building that creates the value. It's what the building brings to the country or to the yeah. desk. That well, it's the effect of the building that is the legitimacy of the building's existence. And that effect can relate, of course, the effect of a building, particularly a building like that, is, is well beyond the effect on its users, well uh, beyond the effect on its immediate stakeholders or whatever. The effect of that building is in the consciousness of much larger uh, groups. The effect of that building is, well, I guess, wow. I mean, there is something like the wow factor. It's even in the dictionary. And so it's wow. And then, you know, people go to marvel uh, at, at that building and it generates attention uh, to a place, to a country that, that desperately needs that attention as its oil reserves diminish, uh, you know, so and and our largest commodity in the current economy, in some way, I guess, is notoriety, is attention. So that's what it does. Um, but I think it's it's very important that you know symbolism and effect are, ve are very very different things. Well, it's like the Steinway building. Every time I go to New York with my brother, I look at it and I'm, I'm astounded by its ugliness and my brother thinks it's nice. Yeah, and well. there's no, it's a private sector. There's no yeah. real effect other than the fact that Barry Diller and some chic can argue about how much they're going to pay for the penthouse and wow. the fact that each floor is residence. But I can't not look at it. It's impossible for me not to look at it. Right. And you talk about the Steinway building as also in the Guinness Book of World Records, correct? The thinnest yes. skyscraper. Yeah. yeah. 
But of course, the point of that essay is you can attribute when you, when you go far enough with the categories of records, <laughs> you can almost uh, attribute a record to every building, you know. And that is it's that taxonomy uh, that I find depressingly reductivist. It's that taxonomy that I rebel against because I mean that you and your brother have different opinions. Uh, about the same building is is of course perfectly okay. There's a wonderful freedom uh, in that. Once that building is measured in every possible way and therefore quantified, taxonomized in every single way, that gets in the way of precisely that speculative freedom and speculative interpretation that is one of the delights, well, I guess of both architecture uh, and art. You know, well, I, I really, really object to, and, and that is the crux of the book, all these terms are in a way covert, uh, covert capitalist terms, to, which ultimately have an economic motive, often a malicious motive, often a counterproductive motive. You know, Vancouver, the most livable city uh, for 10 years, uh, you know, you basically can't live there because nobody can afford it. So the most livable city, nobody can afford to live there. Uh, I mean, you could make similar points about a number of these other uh, criteria, you know, placemaking icons, there's a beautiful placemaking icons where people are on their fourth suicide. Uh, and, and meanwhile, there is a whole thing where we're so blatantly obvious the effects uh, are not the effects embodied in the word uh, that 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 they, that almost these words become kind of painstakingly insulting uh, terms. I work with experienced consultants. My clients appoint them. You know, I have to live with them. I cannot pronounce for the for the life of me. I cannot pronounce that word without irony. I cannot pronounce that job description without irony. I cannot look. Um, at the word placemaking uh, with utter bewilderment. Nevertheless, there are, and nobody knows what it means. People use the word. Um, and there is even, you know, civil servants in, in particular British uh, governmental departments who are director of place, who are uh, chief placemaking officer, uh, whatever. I think our collective consensus around the good around these 10 terms, which supposedly all embody uh, the good is an utterly malignant uh, trend that certainly doesn't get us closer to any truth. Uh, it's, it's an abuse of language in, in the most extreme uh, form. And I noticed the effects on my own creative profession that this is a form of oppression, creative oppression, like the world has never seen before. It's a, it's a, it's a form of, you know, the, our goody 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 uh, thing is a kind of evangelical hypocrisy currently you know shared by the left and the right of the political spectrum by religious people by unreligious people and it's increasingly inescapable and it's suffocating the most pleasant and idiotic award in america is the best place to live in america because <laughs> each, each year each year it changes yeah. and that's impossible right the only reason it, it would be possible is because once you become a best place, people flock to it and make it the unblessed best it's place. It's the worst, but that's what happened to Vancouver. I mean, the whole livability movement, which started as a protest against the the highways, the the, the freeways in the 50s and, and the 60s, I guess for all the right reasons, uh, you know, sort of killed the place with kindness. It became a, a, a real victim of their own success. And once they made their motives explicit and it's partly in in making things explicit that is often the first sign of them becoming a problem very often language even good language indicates that there is already a problem vis-a-vis -vis the terms uh used i was i was going to say something else but i forgot well okay well uh, the term then that we would be led to would be um which may have been kind of like your thought is the most absurd one which is place making because you clearly state at the outset that you have no idea and i'm glad you said it because you should know <laughs> well you yeah no i mean idea. it's well that was no meant to be that was meant to be funny 
it was fun. Everything's funny. Mm. I mean, it's a funny yeah. book. And, yeah, but and it's I essentially think that, the, the book starts with an anecdote with you know, a client who I do not mention by name, uh, but who, you know, uh, that was his brief. You know, it had to be about placemaking. And of course, him being my client, I could only agree. Uh, not... and, and it also sort of made me miss the opportunity of asking him what it was, because he assumed it was such an established term. In fact, it was the term that underlay his reasons for hiring me that I couldn't ask the questions without getting fired. And I didn't want to be fired just then. Uh, so I went along with it. And, and to my greatest shame, and that's how the rest of the essay, I have no idea what he meant. And I went in search. And the more I went in search for meaning, the more of a lost soul I became. Until I realized at the very end that we're all lost soul and that we happily bombed in our shared ignorance of the terms that turn in our successive professed ideologies. The well, subtitle of this book was The Ultimate Guide. I mean, it's, it's a pity that didn't make it. Perzo is 50% American, the publisher. And, and, I, and, and I was told, no, nope. The subtitle was The Ultimate Guide to World-Class, Award-Winning, Innovative, Creative, Livable, and Beautiful Buildings that Foster a Sense of Place and Well-Being. Well, that, was a, that was the subtitle, you know, like Glorious Lessons for the Nation of Kazakhstan, something like that. Um, the American, sorry, that title has to go. Sorry, the American uh, side of the sales department does not agree. And the Americans don't do irony. To which, by the way, you seem a, a very pleasant exception. Well, it, there is no satire in America because when Trump issues NTFs of him in outer space, there's no, so Saturday Night Live couldn't satirize it other than reading it exactly as that's what's happened to America in addition yeah. to the civil Yeah, war. because the reality became such a parody of itself that it defeats satire in the end. The best satire of Trump is Trump himself. You know. He is walking satire it's horrible for com stand-up comedians and i yeah. think they shouldn't even discuss him anymore and there's other comedians who say the same thing but be that as it may that's not going to sell your book so no but well no if we're not talking about the book although i think yeah. the title would have been great because any customer who came in who was interested at all in the subject would buy that book for the title i would in a minute yeah. i don't think they were right but you know it's it's uh I forgot what I was going to say now. Damn it. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I liked the way you were so candid uh, in that conversation with the placemaking guy because you said you, you nodded and smiled. And then he goes, why am I going on and on? You know this so well that I don't need to talk yeah. to you about it. Yeah. Yeah, it's an MO that I won't be able to deploy anymore after this book. I'm afraid. No. Yeah, I know. <laughs> The emperor is naked as far as they're concerned. Yeah. With the wow. what, so, okay, here's another one. Why is um, Pei's uh, uh, pyramid at the Louvre a failure? Is it? I don't know. You kind of said people say it's a failure. You listed it in your list of failures. I mean, not as bad as the Carbuncle Award, but I, mm. I like it. I think it fits perfectly with yeah, I, I don't. I don't dislike it either. Uh, but I, I also don't think I listed as a failure. I think you did. Now you don't, but you said you don't remember your book, so. Well, I, 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 just I mean, there's so many things that I list in the book. I, 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 I don't think I listed it as a failure. I, I listed it, I think, as something that. Well, what about the fact that you listed one World Trade Center? That was in the same sentence, I think. As a failed icon, but I think it is, it, it's, it's, but I mean, I'm partly quoting uh, Charles Jenks there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, so he says it's a failed icon and, and others are successful icons. And I don't know exactly what he means by it, uh, because, but because apparently he has this wonderful way of categorizing the uncategorizable. Obviously, he's the master of, you know, all the streams and substreams that there are in contemporary architecture, only to, I mean, to him, the same thing happens as uh, to the awards, uh, that in, in a way the categories become 
so large in number that they defeat the purpose of being a category. I mean, there are an infinite amount of categories of uh, of of one. So he has iconitis and he has icons, and then certain ones are successful icons, other ones uh, uh, are are not. And I think ultimately, there my conclusion is that there is, to some extent, a certain level of public sector involvement uh, in it, all for the whole thing to endure. I'm going to look up the passage. It's going to take you forever. No, it's not. I mean, I do remember some of my book. Well, if you're, if you put something in there and then attribute the fact that you put it in there, it seems like you would agree with it unless you say you specifically disagree with it. No, no, no. I'm just trying to. I mean, I, um, I'm trying to get to to the point of of the possibility of categorizing. And I analyze attempts uh, to do so. You can't put post-its in your book for me because I'm going to ask you questions that have nothing to do with the post-its. But it's okay. It's, that's fine. I don't want to talk about the Carbuncle Awards and, the, and the, <laughs> the Drake Circus because it's iconic and it's hideous. And it's been, yeah. Should yeah. Talk about, it's, you can't keep it. It's the power of the enigma. That is it. Sorry, I I know I I I I am with the passage, and it's got it. Every, uh, iconitis is a disease that's around. Commented critic Charles Jennings, one of the first uh, to come up with a theory about iconic buildings. The iconic building, the power of the enigma. That's his book, published in two thousand five. Jennings examines the iconic building from a semiological perspective. In the spirit of the nineteen sixties, writing of Umberto Eco and Roland Barthes, claiming that a successful icon is one which has an enigmatic signifier and relies on multiple magnetic force encoded in the image. Le Corbusier's Ronchamp and Gary's Bilbao are two examples. Many more are failed examples, says Ian Pei's Louvre's Pyramid and the World Trade Center, icons which have been reduced to a one-liner. And that is very interesting because, of course, records and the Guinness Book of Records, a record by definition is a one-liner because you can only be the best in that specific thing which is measured and measurement reduces buildings to one liner and therefore are a reduction of complexity, which I think uh, applies to architecture as a whole. So uh, not that I necessarily agree with the example because I think I am pace uh, Louvre pyramid is a lot more than a one liner. So I don't necessarily uh, agree with the examples, but I do uh, to, uh, uh, to a large extent agree with the analysis. Yeah, but you use words like idiotic to describe buildings and monster, and yeah. you're not. A, that's not an attribution. You say it. Uh, idiotic is my own, and monster is also my own. That's my own. Uh, I think those are adjectives that I use uh, in the context of capital gate. You know, and given all the prof speak uh, and and blurry language uh, at the end. You know, idiotic and monster, aren't they wonderfully clear terms? Yes. I mean, wouldn't you really wish, wouldn't you really wish more writers and people and public officials would simply use those, those yes. words? Yeah. Yes, but they don't have the courage to do so. It doesn't necessarily help them move forward in their life or career. Mm -hmm. I mean, I admire your guts in doing so. It's just that, yeah, I, yes, that's basically it. I do admire that. What about? I don't um, know. It's it's it's. I don't know whether it's it's. Maybe this is an interesting anecdote. I uh, so my first major book is called Four Walls and a Roof, uh, which is a collection of of essays, partly columns that appeared before, partly pieces I wrote uh, afterwards to make the collection of essays seem slightly coherent. But I was nervous as hell before that book came out. I was incredibly nervous because, I mean, I'm part of a big firm. I have a responsibility for the economy of that firm. I need to bring in projects. I need to retain clients. There are over 300 mouths to feed uh, as part of the stuff I do. So I was very, very, very nervous uh, then. But it was okay. I mean, it was received fairly well. Uh, I think I, I once published a diary in a Middle Eastern journal in 2008, and the entire edition of the journal had to go into the shredder.
because somebody was upset and that was somebody who was very important and who knew other people that were very but i mean i guess i learned to some extent i learned very well how far to go too far you yeah know, you don't want to get the, and, you don't want to get the fatwa era you know area and i i also steer uh, uh clear of certain other things but i mean jonathan meads uh, in in the review of the first book said something similar uh to you he said the you know the pension for biting the hand that feeds him is admirably risky i read it yep yeah so i thought that was an enormous compliment particularly because it nailed also the nervousness that i myself felt just before that book came out i so said i really i thought there's no way that I uh, know how this ends up. I remember getting so nervous that I put a disclaimer in, and the disclaimer woke up the lawyers at Harvard University Press that for the first time then started to look at the book, and 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 the whole thing was put on hold for 48 hours because my nervousness sort of made my editor nervous, called the lawyers in, but then said, oh, don't worry. Yeah. You did. I mean, you're talking about specific buildings and you're saying it's monstrous. So, yeah. Wow. One thing I wanted to ask you about, have you seen or been in Moino Moynihan Hall next to the Penn Station? Uh, not that I remember. Well, it's your, your uh, entry, the one, uh, one chapter where the, uh, who says, uh, who said people tend to sit where there are places to sit, which is yeah. <laughs> yeah. the line of the book, but you didn't write it. Yeah. Well, so Moynihan Hall has no seats because yeah. they didn't want to have seats because they didn't want homeless people staying. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, so I went there and I had to sit on the floor, as did everybody else. Yeah. And that goes back to my form and function thing. You know, but then, and that made it a place more than any seat could have ever made it. It did. Right? Yes. And only, and, and things turn into a place, not because we do placemaking or call something a place, you know. These explicitizing, and I think Slavoj Zizek talks about political correctness in the way that it makes explicit to some extent something that we all share. And precisely because it makes it explicit, we no longer share it. It becomes a debatable thing and therefore it undermines a lot of the objectives it, it aims to prescribe. But the thing is people tend to sit where there are places to sit. That's William H. White and then Fred can about William H. White said they thought he was onto something, and he was. <laughs> I thought there was such a beautiful coalescence of banality that it's it, pure poetry. Well, maybe uh, to solve the problem of you and your compatriots, we should just move on to what you discuss, and much like AI chatbots in the United States, algorithmic architecture. Then we don't yeah. even need you. Mm -hmm. Why not? What about it? Yeah, I mean, it's like 3D printing and AI, I mean, I could- Well, 3D printing is something different than AI architecture. Yeah, it is, it I is. Mean, it's very that different. I'm, I'm all in favor of 3D printing because it, it, it sort of limits the power of contractors. In theory, makes them superfluous in, in the long run, which would make my life in some way a lot more pleasurable. Um, oh, yeah. The AI, I don't know. I'm, I'm fascinated. And I'm also fascinated because I, I try to write about it. I did. I, I'm not a. I mean, I'm of an age that I'm not a very digital person. I'm interested in the digital, but I mean, if I compare myself to my kids, right. I'm of course an idiot and a monster, uh, and uh, and there, but I'm interested in the subject matter. But it's the intriguing thing there is you write about it, and by the time you finish your essay, in a way, what you list as examples and write about is already out of date. So things go very fast. We are currently. Uh, in the office working on an artificial intelligence campus somewhere in Germany, uh, an industrial area where, you know, certain businesses who are into that kind of stuff reside. The design is meant to be a showcase of what it uh, houses, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We tried to sort of, we had our first initial stab of trying to design that with AI you know, in the limited capacity that it exists at the moment, and the results weren't very encouraging yet. That is not to say that they won't be in the long run. Who's to know, you know? Yeah. Uh, 
everything changes and no one really wants to embrace change, especially the owners of commercial properties uh, that need to make money. So in America now, offices are passe. Yeah. You order your employees to come back in. They don't because unemployment is 3.5%. So office space is not going to be something you're going to be given commissions for in the near future. No. Well, office the nature of office space fundamentally changes. People come to the office. Well, I wouldn't say to socialize, but to engage in collective activities, but actually doing labor and the labor you do behind the desk uh, diligently that you can do from home. So the whole nature of offices there uh, changes. It's a little bit different for architecture because, I mean, we found during the pandemic, you can work from home in certain phases of projects, but I mean, the early phases of projects, the creative inception, particularly the way we work, there is no way that you can do that remotely, not sitting in the same space, not messing around with material and, and things, seeing people's facial expression when you propose certain ideas. Well, you know. yeah, but now you, you've been in on thousands of them, How part of which is how you came up with your dictionary. You have a Zoom meeting with not two or three of us, but 50 <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I know, I know. You can see them. I mean, uh, well, I mean, I, I must say, Corona, COVID, was a lot more productive for me in terms of writing than it was in terms of architecture. So it it, it served that kind of. But also the weird thing there was that, you know, we used to have. It's I, I remember a project going from physical meetings, regular physical meetings, to going online, and of course with a limited budget. Only so many people could travel, only so many people could attend. It was a fixed group of people. And then all of a sudden, the same presentations that I've been doing to about six people, all of a sudden, they turn into mini lectures with 100 attendees because the entire engineering firm decided to log in. Uh, you know, and again, uh, probably 95 of those 100 faces I never saw because the camera was off and they were probably doing something else with the sound on or they were muted, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's an interesting mix of uh, extremely committed non-committalness. That reminds, that reminds me, I don't know why, because we haven't talked about sustainability yet, but I, in your, uh, I forget where you were giving the talk. It was where you showed the picture of the world leaders all seeming to be very, very happy. Yeah, and you, yeah. you suggested that there's, the size of their smiles was inversely proportional to the sustainability efforts of that specific country. Yeah, well, it was proportional to their degree of CO2 emission, exactly. to their carbon footprint. So that was the, <laughs> yes. So your chapters on sustainability, and when you talk about, um, um, I'm looking up the books, what's the first one? Uh, blueprint for survival. You talk about manifesto for a sustainable society, the limits of growth. That's the closest you come, the Green Party. That's the closest co you come in the book to really being very, very serious. Yeah. And it's close to your heart in your TED talk. Yeah. Well, the whole book is in some way serious, I must say. Yeah. But it's, see, as a bookseller again, a good book, the humor drives the reader forward. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. anyway so sustainability and, and you going through those books and the evolution of it and then saying hey um 2030 we haven't really done shit yeah so what's going to happen i well i don't know i mean the world is well the world currently is in such a state with acute risks that even something as ubiquitous ubiquitously urgent as climate change seems to sort of slide uh uh to a lesser priority i mean the first priority at some point is going to be the aversion of war real war uh, i mean a war that will you know we we have a sort of global proxy war uh, at the moment partly because of the existence of nuclear weapons we can't escalate anymore and and in a way um uh, the substitute for escalation is prolonging with wars, that's what we see, 30, 40 year old wars, fought by proxies, which, you know, I don't know what's gonna happen to Ukraine. I don't know how long that's gonna continue. I don't know how many countries will be dragged into it, but the more we are, obviously the fight for that kind of survival, uh, 
is going to trump the urgency of any survival vis-a-vis -vis climate change. And war will, of course, also exacerbate climate change. Yeah, and it's uh, the bulletin of atomic scientists, you know, move the clock to 100 um, seconds. At the same time, war, I mean, probably all invention, all human technological invention is more a product of war than it is of peace. That is also a very, very nasty uh, reality. So I, I really don't know. The subject is less humorous than the other ones, precisely because I think it's also a subject that's a little bit too serious, uh, you know, to treat lightly. I would say, although I don't like the word sustainability, it's overused, it's over abused. Uh, so many works and and efforts see the light of day that are completely unsustainable under that guise. So, but of course, the underlying urgency I take very seriously. I mean, I think the livability index is total bullshit. Uh, I think sustainability measurements, provided they are scientifically sound, honest, and complete, of course, make a certain amount of sense. Well, you do take your uh, your satirical pen to the concept of green. I mean, in America, if you sell a cookie that has a green box, as opposed yeah. to a brown box, it will sell. Yeah. I do it. Yeah. yeah. It still has the same amount of high fructose corn syrup. It's just as a green box. It's green. There you go. Green is a color. So green is a profit center, and you yeah. do you, you do discuss about that. Uh, yeah, 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 and you and it's and it's an adjective, a noun, and a verb. So you can green, green, green. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, so what do you think of Albert Speer's architecture? Uh, which the father of the son, the Nazi. <laughs> All right, because you know he has a son. No, I didn't know. Okay, he has a son, which is an extremely successful commercial architect who does predominantly low-rise housing, quarters, business parks, perfectly respectable, run-of-the-mill uh, architects in the pastures of Germany. Uh, he was also a candidate, I think, to do one of the stadiums in Qatar, but never quite made it. That was the other dude from Gercom. Um, so I, don't know, I met him once. It was very interesting. I met him when uh, I was on a jury of a competition in which he participated. It was for some research center for BMW. We were in the same hotel. He ran into me and he said to me in German, uh, I believe I haven't properly politely introduced myself to you, Albert Speer. <laughs> and it was, it, I mean, there was something really wonderfully unabashed about that. And of course I knew the father, I mean, the Nazi or, I mean, that's the ultimate guy, huh? Was he a Nazi or wasn't he? I mean, it turns out that he was, but because he was an architect, he had had artistic deniability for the longest sense, you know, never having been in the camps, allegedly, never having anything to do with that. He was the you know, naive artist which wanted to build buildings and found a great patron in the Führer. And of course, with successive historic revisions, um, it became clear that it was a little less straightforward as that, or that it was in some ways more straightforwardly ugly uh, than, than, than portrayed, but that's... Uh, yeah, but that, I guess I was trying to say that because that leads into... I don't know if your book really touches it or not, but the moral implications... You're going to think this is silly too, like prop speak, but the moral implications of architecture... Yeah, I will write five books in my life. This is number three. The next one will be a work of fiction. Uh, and I will try to do that about um, somebody involved in a project that it's it's a kind of science nonfiction. It's somebody involved in, it plays out in the near future, 2030. Not too far away from now. It's about the fate of a very giant project under construction at the moment that ends up being serving a rather different purpose than its intended purpose. I can say no more, but the, the, the question about morals is implicitly uh, targeted in that. My last book will be a book about, uh, about architecture and power and working for power, the powers that be, that drive architecture, uh, maybe even containing anecdotal evidence of my own practice 
working for non-democratic regimes, um, working for non-democratic corporations, which you know, corporations are non-democratic almost by definition, public accountability, the impossibility of public accountability, it will be uh, about that. And, and I think, well, you've just given the, me the idea that in my last book, probably Speer will feature. Is it as a, as a dilemma? I mean, I think that not only am I a close reader, but I gave you the ability to give me a preface of your next two books at the same time. It's pretty good. Very good. Now I'm enjoying. Uh, I'm. I, I mean, I'm very much enjoying you putting me on the spot. Yeah, but at, you're you're really hard to put on the spot. Yeah. Well, I'm an architect, so I, I have to be, I'm, I'm slippery by professional training. Right. And I'm a lawyer, so I have to do the same thing. Wow. Well, anyway, to conclude, I was thinking I would ask you, not, not your five favorite, but what are some of your favorite prof speak words? Because we can't go through the entire dictionary, but maybe a half a dozen or so or less. However, many um, I, I very much like Brett crumbing. I, I thought that, oh, that that one was hilarious. Uh, yeah. Uh, that is my uh, one of my one of my favorites. The other one is real work, <laughs> as opposed to what uh, walkable neighborhood. I, I think is 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 a very beautiful. I mean, the, particularly the ones where you can just cite the example that. Uh, that is, and then, then, then the other one that I absolutely adore is successful building. As a the one, the ones that are prefaced by the word people, I was thinking, okay, dogs, cats, um, yeah. what other uh, creature? Well, could... people first design. It's it's you know, talk on or talking on a more serious note. People first design. What does that mean? It means that as opposed to people first design, there is design. The word design becomes an antonym to people first design. So you add an adjective or a prefix to the word. And, and the ultimate purpose of that prefix is that it disqualifies the very word itself upon, upon which it still relies. I mean, people first design is a very clever way of declaring all design in a way that people last design and anybody who was simply involved in design and who doesn't overtly profess also to be in people first design a suspicious individual. I mean, there are some of the malignant uh, uh, effects of kind of prospect. You know, these extreme demonstration of virtue, which raise suspicion almost over anyone who doesn't express uh, himself or herself in the same extreme demonstration, in the same virtuous terms. Who would so think it's, it's kind of mandatory speech in, in, in by default and by stealth. Who would have thought that this book would be a book about grammar? Yeah, not me at the beginning. Well, it sort of, and it sort of ended up that way. Well, thanks so much for being here. And thanks for uh, breaking down some of these concepts. And as I said, you know, I'm the first to admit I'm a lay person and it's going to be a lay audience in many ways and in many cases that read this book. And I think, again, I've given you two reasons why a book is good. And the third is because a person feels like, okay, it's not like it's a self-help book, but it's, it's a book in which you can, it's not like graduate school, but you can have an education during the process of reading. So I appreciate that. Okay. All right. Well, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was really fun. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.